live the adventure of G.I. Joe. Throughout the history of vintage action figures, there are accessories that have become the bane of a collector's existence due to their small scale or rarity or both. In the 1980s, it seemed toy designers relished the opportunity to make items for action figures that were so small, they were lost in the blink of an eye. Whether it was Princess Leia's blaster, green arrows, uh, arrows, any Starcom figure's weapon, Voltron pilot's helmets, or pretty much everything that came with Mutagen Man, 1980s action figures have a minefield of small parts that make finding complete examples an absolute endurance challenge. In many cases, these rarities can be chalked up to the obscurity of the line itself. If the line wasn't popular, then obviously not many were made, making accessories tougher to locate by default. However, in the cases of Star Wars, G.I. Joe, and Transformers, these toys sold extremely well for many years. These lines aren't rare from any perspective, which means for parts and pieces to be rare in these lines, it requires a sadistic level of design cruelty on the part of the toy makers. These pieces had to be instantly losable. And when it comes to toy lines that were mega popular, but had copious numbers of microscopic accessories that seemed created only to frustrate anyone and everyone, while being as rare as platinum in the 21st century, despite being made by the millions at one time, G.I. Joe occupies the number one spot. From Outback's blasted flashlight to that stupid railing on the back of the USS flag, to Rock and Roll's infuriating bipod, to the spotlight lens on the Cobra hydrofoil, G.I. Joe is a madhouse, and all of us who collect it are its masochistic inmates. And yet, for all of the tiny parts and pieces, the ones that cause the most frustration tend to be the minuscule communications accessories added to the heads and helmets of a handful of the figures. All respect to the designers of G.I. Joe for wanting to provide detail. But when it goes from adding authenticity to the level of, eh, 99% of these are going to end up lost within uh, seconds, I start to question the rationale of this exercise. Helmet microphones go all the way back to the original 13 Joes, where Breaker had an entire communications assembly that clipped onto his helmet and attached to his backpack via an extremely fragile plastic cable. But at least the microphone was clearly an accessory and large enough to retain, even if the cable snapped off at some point. After this, however, the designers started exercising their enjoyment in inflicting pain. At this stage, it was the clear helmet visors that were the most easily lost part on some of the figures. But when the Mahler tank showed up in 1985, someone at Hasbro said, Helmet visors? Hold my beer! The driver of the Mahler, Heavy Metal, came with an accessory so tiny, it was often thrown away with the box before anyone knew it was supposed to go with the figure. A tiny brown helmet microphone that plugged into the right side of the sculpted helmet on his head. At this stage, the designers had abandoned the removable helmets, which was a nice evolution. No more lost helmets. But they were determined to give us something to stress out losing. And it was this brown plastic helmet mic. Even if you kept the figure inside, that mic would not survive a fall into shag carpet or under a couch. It was so small, it would never be found again. From there, Hasbro decided helmet mics were the new hotness. They became almost as excited about helmet mics as they were for rubber hoses. For the love of God, so many stupid hoses. There was a brief moment of sanity when Dial Tone came out because, using the same logic they had with Breaker, his microphone was integrated into his backpack. Although this could be broken off, at least it was big enough that you had a good chance of keeping it intact if you were careful. And because it was part of the chunky backpack, losing it was far less likely. However, the same year saw the release of the Tomahawk and its pilot, Lift Ticket. The helmet mic was back, now on the left side of the head of one of the goofiest looking G.I. Joe figures of all time. This mic was going to be gone in seconds if it didn't fit tightly in the hole and if you didn't keep this guy in the chopper at all times. It's a strange choice given the logic they applied to dial tone for playability, and especially when you consider the previous year they released the Televiper, Cobra's communications troop, who had all of his communications tech built into his helmet, so it was all assumed in the sculpt and not designed as a separate tiny part. Then came 1987, arguably the most infuriating year for tiny figure parts in the entire run of the Real American Hero line. 
Hoses were dialed up to 20 that year with the Techno Viper and Fast Draw in the range. Falcon was packed with a fragile backpack radio antenna that was easily lost or broken. Outback arrived with that damnable flashlight. Tunnel Rat had two of those flashlights to lose. Ice Viper came with two tiny daggers, and the number of breathing hoses that appeared in the line was baffling. It's like someone at Hasbro jumped up in a meeting and said, Dude, for 1987, it's all about breather hoses. Big Boa, Croc Master, Fast Draw, and Cobra Commander himself all came with tiny, easily lost breathing hoses. In the midst of that, three figures pushed this new trend in helmet communications accessories to levels so maddening you and your best friend considered BMXing it off a cliff Thelma and Louise style just to escape the frustration. In the basic range was Sneak Peek. This was the figure named after Stephen King's son, and he was loaded down with more crap than Link in The Legend of Zelda. A bull! I got a bull! Good for me! But there was one last object to be located. A massive periscope, a pair of binoculars, a slinged M16, a walkie-talkie, and a helmet mic. I'm not even sure why he needs a helmet mic and a hand radio. But whatever. So I told Starduster, being an Avatar fan is like being a fan of packing peanuts. It doesn't matter how many of them they make, they're never going to be interesting and they're never going to be worth a damn. Uh, headquarters come in. This is Owen. I mean, sneak peek. Ah, ah, ah. God, jeez. Hey, Owen, a little feedback for you? First rule of communications, don't put two microphones that close to one another. Feedback, buddy. Feedback. Who recruited this guy? Was it Mainframe? You better not tell me it was Jernigan. The helmet mic was usually lost right before the walkie-talkie. No surprise, right? They even managed to get a helmet mic on the Royal Guard in the Cobra La 3-pack, because there's nothing like a troop builder trapped in an expensive 3-pack and having an easily lost helmet mic. Annoying as it was to load up the lamest G.I. Joe next to Psych Out in the 1987 wave with all of this gear, and give the lamest villains in the history of the franchise a helmet mic as well to keep up with, this was nothing compared to the special torture Hasbro built into two vehicle drivers in the 1987 wave. One was the famous Defiant Space Shuttle. Good rule of thumb, every single piece of the Defiant is worth the cost of a used car at this point. So you can imagine the implications when I tell you one of the two figures that came with the vehicle, Hardtop, had a helmet mic. Yeah, imagine that accidentally getting thrown away on Christmas morning. Now imagine having an original helmet mic for your payload figure. I like to call them by the wrong name to let them know I don't really care about them. Here's one in my possession. I'm considering selling it in a few years so I can buy myself a small Banana Republic. However, while Hardtop's mic might just be the most expensive mic to lose next to heavy metals, it's the Maggot Driver's helmet accessory that likely holds the record for the most often lost accessory in the G.I. Joe line after heavy metals. Worms, the driver of the maggot, Cobra's mobile howitzer, came with a removable Rocketeer-style helmet that incorporated the tiniest antenna onto it as a removable piece. I do not understand why they made this a removable part. It makes the Action Force troop carrier's turret antenna seem massive by comparison. It just seems like gleeful cruelty especially when it could have been molded onto the helmet as part of the accessory, like they did with a number of backpack antennas. In 1989, Hasbro would bring all of this full circle with Scoop, a figure with a removable helmet, a big rubber hose, and a removable helmet mic. Scoop might be an expert at finding the story, but you'll never find all of his stuff. G.I. Joe, a real American hero, has cemented its place in history as one of the boldest, ambitious toy lines ever made. But that confidence came with a dash of insanity that resulted in some of the rarest action figure accessories ever made out of plastic. And with the second-hand prices of complete examples of these miked figures rising every year, the determination and deep pockets a collector needs to reach the finish line comes in loud and clear. Hold on, we're not done yet. Sergeant, I'm sick of losing this bipod everywhere I go. And the brass has been promising us upgraded uniforms and gear for I don't know how long. When are we getting new stuff? Well, your timing couldn't be better, rock and roll. The paperwork went through a few months ago, and this afternoon the delivery arrived. I am proud to say we all have upgraded uniforms and equipment. Yes, finally. G.I. Joe will return after these messages. 
Now, back to G.I. Joe. Wait a minute. What the heck is this? Sarge, are you telling me their idea of an upgrade is this? I look like an Oklahoma noodling champion. And look at Snake Eyes. That change of clothes should be classified as a hostile work environment. And don't even get me started on you. You know you look like a Sherpa on Everest. I mean, what gives? How come the Steel Brigade guys are the only ones who look awesome after this upgrade? 